you've got your Bible, I'd invite you to grab it, turn up the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Our Bible reading this morning is actually going to be given by a bit of a Riverview legend. So I'm going to invite Maddie Edlin to come up. So come on up, Matthew. I, I love this guy. I love working with him. Do you know, he's been on our staff for 34 years. Get, Give me a wave if you're younger than 34. There's a bunch of people that weren't even born, Matthew, whenever you joined the team at Riverview. Anyway, Matthew, would you read the word for us? Thanks, mate. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter... A girl of about 12 was dying. As Jesus was on the way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing up against you. But Jesus said, somebody touched me. I know the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at his feet in the presence of all the people. And she told him why she had touched him and how she had been healed instantly. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe. And she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told her, told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Thanks, Matthew. That was awesome. I love stories. I love to hear stories. And you probably know enough about me now to know that I love to tell stories. And you probably know enough about me now to know that I tell too many stories. And I had this realization that this is a truth in my life this week whenever I came home and walked into our living room where my kids were doing a performance piece for my wife where they were doing an impression of me (laughs) telling stories. And as I walked in, Shay, who's my youngest in what can only be described as a sketchy Northern Irish accent, was doing his impression of me at the shoe shop last week while Shay and I were getting some new shoes whenever the lady at the counter asked me about my strange accent and where it's from. And Shay just thinks it's hilarious that every time someone asks me that question, I can get from Ireland to Australia via Canada and always arrive at talking about the Lord. And he just thinks this is hilarious, and he's so embarrassed by what he calls dad's one story. (laughs) In every shop and every opportunity, this story seems to come out. I, I love stories because I think they're incredibly important to the life of faith. We are a storied people. You are a storied person. I wonder if you ever thought about yourself in that way before. Your life has a beginning, and it will have an end. I know you maybe don't know that yet, but it will have an end. And there are plot lines, and there are twists, and there are adventures, and there are victories, and there is suffering and struggles. Life is a story. And the beauty of the Christian life is that all of our stories then end up being bound up together into an even greater story. For me, the stories of Jesus are truly amazing. Did you feel that as Matthew read from the gospel for us today. So much different than even reading from the epistles or the Old Testament. When we read the stories of Jesus, something seems to resonate within us. 
Jared C. Wilson, who's an American pastor and author, has a book called The Storytelling God. I just, I love the title alone, The Storytelling God. But this is one of the quotes from that book. He says, only God can write a story that resonates not just in the power of the imagination or the heart or the mind, but in the very soul. Only God can write a story that brings dead things to life. God is in the business of writing stories and your life and my life and our lives together are part of his story. In my study Bible that I was working through this week, the passage that Matthew read for us is entitled, A Girl Restored to Life and a Woman Healed. And I just knew whenever the Lord had put this passage on my heart for this sermon that this was going to be a special story. And it is a special story. In all four Gospels, only one time, in all the miracles and stories of Jesus, only one time is there a moment where two miracles are intertwined together. And it's this moment here. These two miracles come together and then are bound up into an even bigger story. Now, if you were here last week, you'll remember that it was a pretty big day for us here at Riverview as we shared our vision for where we're going as a church. And I don't expect that you've remembered it, okay? So just going to remind you of the very first part of that vision, and it's this, that everyone will be known in community. And with it, there's this little strap line where we talk about Riverview becoming a relational community who pay attention to one another with the affection of Christ. I don't know if you've thought about it yet or you've had the opportunity to think about being a relational community, a place where we are all known is actually a deeply theological issue. And for me, no story in the Bible helps us understand what this means more than this story that we've just read in Luke chapter eight that Matthew read for us this morning. Today, we're gonna learn together about the journey from being a crowd to becoming a community. We're going to see that there's a difference. We're going to see how Jesus, as he does life and ministry, doesn't just level the playing fields. In his kingdom, he actually just turns everything upside down. How leadership becomes servanthood, about how self-confidence becomes divine dependence. And ultimately, what we're going to learn today in this story is that Jesus invites us, first and foremost, to be known by him. That's the starting place of being known in community. Now, Luke chapter 8 is set against the backdrop of a huge crowd. A huge crowd are congregating together to get close to Jesus. Now, crowds, as you know, can be exciting. Back in 2019, 61,241 people packed into the Optus Stadium to set a new record. Now, you would have thought that was for a game between the Dockers and St. Kilda, but it wasn't. It was for a rugby match. Imagine that in Western Australia, the largest crowd ever was for rugby match. It was the Wallabies against the All Blacks, 2019 Bledisloe Cup. And guess who won? The Wallabies. They beat the All Blacks and not only beat them, but they beat them by a record amount. It seems that crowds really matter. In Belfast, my home rugby team is called Ulster and they play on Friday nights in this tiny little packed stadium uh, called, it used to be called Ravenhill, it's now called Kingspan Stadium. And only 15,000 people can pack into this, but they designed the stadium so that the players are so close to the stands. So whenever you're in the stands, the game's happening, you can almost touch the players. And what has happened is, as they've designed that stadium, is the volume of the crowd and the intensity of the crowd is so much that when teams are coming to Belfast to play against the Ulster rugby team, they train and prepare as if they're starting the game 15 points down. That's how influential a crowd can be. So crowds can be exciting. Crowds can be influential. As we learned in the month of October, crowds can be dangerous. Like in the tragedy in Korea, in the bridge collapse in India, the Indonesian soccer stadium. The month of October was, was literally a terrible month for crowds in Asia. And our hearts and thoughts go out to many, many people. Many of you might even be known to us. Crowds can be exciting places, they can be influential places, they can be scary places, they can also be great places to hide. I don't know if anyone else is a fan of James Bond 
or Jason Bourne. I've kind of found as I watch these types of movies, and they're pretty much my favorite genre of movie, is that as the hero is trying to escape or get away from the bad guy, there's almost always a crowd miraculously appears at a train station, in a nightclub, a parade walking down the street, and all of a sudden they can just blend into the crowd and they're completely hidden. Now, to the point now that if I'm walking down the street and there's a crowd that miraculously appears, I just assume I'm on the set of some sort of movie or that somewhere in this crowd is a spy who's trying to escape. You know, there are people that come to Riverview to hide. That's actually one of the things that I've had to learn. And I had to think about as we thought about our vision, everyone known in community, because we know that traditionally Riverview has been this sort of church in Perth where people have been able to come along and hide quietly in a corner somewhere. This is the sort of people who come late, leave early, and they just need a space to land, to heal, to be in God's presence, to be around God's people, but they need space, they need time, they need all that good stuff. And one of the processes that we had to go through as we were thinking about our vision was to ask the question, will our vision actually turn people like that away? As we are trying to draw a community and people to be known, are we actually pushing other people away? And I actually think that's a really good question, right? You probably agree with that. That's a good question. Here is my hope. My hope is that as we become a relational community who pay attention to one another with the affection of Christ, that actually we would do an even better job at understanding that for some people, that's exactly what they need in this season. And part of actually being known in this community is that we give permission to do just that. Permission to come and to rest and be renewed and be restored. And trust God that in the right time, you'll be able to move forward relationally as well. Crowds are awesome, but they don't always mean community, right? They don't always mean community. You can exist in a crowd for a long time and be lost. And in our gospel story today, there is an unnamed, unknown woman who has existed outside community for what must feel like forever. If you've got your Bible open, you can still see it in front of you. 12 years, 12 years. In Bible times, her health issues had disqualified her from belonging. If she had lived till possibly 50, if she'd been incredibly healthy in that day and lived to 60, she would have spent a huge part of her life outside of belonging, outside of community. Whenever I was a little kid, on the last day of school, my parents would roll up to school to pick us up the car would be loaded up with all the stuff for our holidays. Some of you remember back in those days, there were no seatbelts, there were no limits to what you could squeeze into the car, no limits to how many people you could squeeze into the car. Cars were packed and this car would have been absolutely packed and with sleeping bags and food and all the stuff and we were heading off on our holidays. And when I would get into the car, my mom, we Sandra, would always talk about that for the first 30 minutes of that car ride as we headed off on our holidays, I would literally be sobbing like a baby. And when she would ask me what was wrong, I had this fear that after two or three weeks away on holiday, my friends would not remember who I was. <laughs> that I would be unknown. Now that, that's three weeks. Now I imagine 12 years. 12 years where no one has spoken to you. 12 years where no one has looked at your face. 12 years where no one has called out your name. That's the story of this poor lady, and she was poor. The story tells us she'd spent all of her money on trying to get well, but she'd been out, outside of community, beyond connection, unclean, defiled, and cut off for a dozen years. In Leviticus chapter 15, and I thought about putting these verses up on the screen, but they would probably just gross a lot of people out. So I'll give you a little bit of a paraphrase. But in Leviticus 15, it tells us this, that when a woman is bleeding, beyond her normal monthly bleeding. She will be unclean for as long as that bleeding continues. The story we're told that the woman's bleeding had not stopped for how many years? 12 years, that is 12 years of being unclean. In Leviticus 15, 27, we're actually told that anyone who touches them will become unclean. And not only that, they must take all of their clothes and bathe in water and they will be unclean. So you've got this huge cleanliness issue. 
Everything is stacked against this woman, absolutely everything. But on this day, in this story that we read about Jesus, everything changes. But here's the thing that we can miss. This story is about more than her being healed. In this story, she's invited to belong. Now, she is audacious. She is reckless, hiding in the crowd, moving through a crowd, moving through a great amount of people. Look, what is happening is she moves through the crowd. She's touching people. So what does Leviticus tell us about her touching people? If she touches them, what happens? They become unclean, right? Everyone's going to the laundrette. There is so much laundry to be done this night. And she moves through the crowd. She's audacious as she makes her way towards Jesus because when she's at the bottom, she's realized that there's nowhere else to go and she's heard a story about a miracle worker from Nazareth. And maybe things could change. Maybe things could change. And so she, in fact, she is so audacious that she reaches out and does she grab Jesus' hand? No, she grabs Jesus's cloak, his cloak, right? His clothes. And Leviticus tells us that if she touches someone's clothes, that person becomes unclean. So you got, this is so reckless. But this is where she's at in her journey. And so she reaches out, she grabs Jesus, but in this amazing kingdom reversal, instead of power going out from her to make him unclean, we're told that power goes out from him to make her whole to make her clean. How amazing is that? But that's not the amazing thing about the story because we totally expect a miracle worker to do miracles. The amazing thing about the story is that Jesus stops despite being super busy and on his way to a sick child. He stops, he addresses the crowd, he calls this unnamed woman out of hiding and in the community with one word. Did you see it? You probably read it. Glossed over it, because that's what we do, but here's the one word, daughter. Daughter. Because that is this woman's true name. Daughter, you are part of my family. You are a child of Abraham. I see the image of God in you. Nobody has dared to look at you, to speak at you, to include you, to invite you, to add you on Facebook, to follow you on Instagram, Jesus says, I see you, daughter. And in that moment, giving her that title, he adds to her life dignity and value and hope and belief and an invitation into his covenant community. You see, this is what it means to look at someone with the affection of Jesus. That's what that means, the affection of Jesus It's to see the divine in one another. It's to see the image of God in the people around us. It's to see the fingerprint of God in the life of the stranger. It's to know the spirit of God in the heart of a brother and sister. In our vision movie, which um, has been forever ruined, by the way, by one of our worship leaders, Patrick Yeo, who made a parody and put it on my Facebook page, took our beautiful vision video, Patrick, thank you very much, and put the theme tune to Cheers, the TV show on it, where everybody knows your name. And now we can never watch that movie seriously ever again. But if you got a chance to see the movie, in the movie, I talk a little bit about my journey with loneliness. Now, my journey with loneliness is from a place of immense privilege, unlike this woman. Like, I was surrounded by people who were paying attention to me and adding dignity to my life, but I still struggled with loneliness. And one of the things I say in the video is this. It turns out that being known is the remedy for feeling alone. Being known is the gateway for uncovering our place and purpose in the world and for experiencing the love and grace of Jesus through others. See, at Riverview, we are becoming a relational community. Can I just stop right there? We're not there yet. We're not there yet, but we're on the journey and that's where we're going. We wanna be the sort of church who pay attention to one another with the affection of Christ Jesus. And the reason we wanna do that, it's not because it's a nice idea, it's because stories like this in the gospel show us that this is deeply theological. This is actually what it is to follow Jesus, to begin to see people the way that he does. Henry Nouwen once noted that the mystery of the spiritual life is that Jesus desires to meet us in the seclusion of our own heart, 
to make his love known to us there, to free us from our fears, and to make his own deepest self known to us. Guys, that's what's happening in this moment in this story, is Jesus is making himself known to this woman in the seclusion of her own heart. He's making his love known to her there. He's freeing her from her fears, and he's making his deepest self known to us. He's making her deepest self known to her. This is what is happening in her story, and this is what can happen in our stories with Jesus. Jesus' final word to this woman is, go in peace. Go in peace. A command from the Prince of Peace to now and go and find shalom in your life. Shalom is wholeness and wellness and purpose. That's what we talk about in our vision wholeness and wellness and purpose. Jesus invites us into his peace. Well, listen, I get it. I get that some people are here today and you're like, whoa, I really resonate with that woman. I would love to belong. I'm on the outside. I would love to be in the end. But for many of us, we don't resonate with that at all. We're popular. People like us. People are around us. People care about us. And that's what's beautiful about this story because there's a second protagonist. There's not just a woman with no name. There's a man who everybody knows his name. And that man is called Jairus. And we're told that Jairus isn't at the end of the spectrum in community where nobody knows him. He's outside. He's actually at the other end of the spectrum in community and that he's at the very center all community revolves around him. The Greek word for his, his under, to understand his title is archon, which means that he is the main elder in the local synagogue. Everything in the community revolved around him. I don't know if, you, if there's any Vicar of Dibley fans here. Any Vicar of Dibley fans? A few of you, awesome. So good, it's such, a, such a good show. But you know the guy, not the vicar, but you know the guy who chairs the board and in reality, he holds the power, he holds the influence, everything spins around him. This is Jairus in this community. Because, of course, in biblical times, the synagogue was at the very center of life. And he was at the center of the synagogue. So all of life, all of community revolves around this man. He is powerful, he is influential, he is wealthy, he is strong, he is popular. But here's the beauty of Jairus' story. The beauty of Jairus' story is that it reminds us to not trust what we see on the surface of people's lives. Behind the facade of wealth and popularity and influence and control and power and security are real people with real struggles and real challenges. They might be different than many of ours, but they are real people with real struggles and pain and brokenness and loss. And part of paying attention to one another with the affection of Christ Jesus is seeing, this is really important, church, is seeing that people are more than their stuff. People are more than their stuff, more than their status. And that's why we have to learn to pay attention to one another's stories. You know, I learned this ver very early on as a pastor. I remember one night, my phone going, and what felt like the middle of the night, it probably wasn't because I go to bed so early, like maybe 11 or 12, but I was startled out of my sleep I got a phone call from a parishioner in a church, and they really needed me to come to their house. There was nothing for it. Chat wouldn't do. I needed to go. I woke Rebecca up. I'm like, I need to go. And she knew it was serious. And so off I went to this person's house, and I get to the house, and I go inside, and the mom and dad in this house are at the kitchen table, and they're just in floods of tears. And the house looks like a storm has blown through it. Stuff is everywhere. And they were battling with one of their teenage kids who was totally lost control, drug-infused. It was just a disaster. It was horrible. It was a nightmare. It was such a broken and terrible space to go in there. I remember walking in. God, you need to empower me here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to handle this. I'm walking into this space. Now, here's the thing. When I say space, I mean space. This was a mega mansion. And this family is probably the richest family that I've ever known so big. That table that they were crying at could have seated 30 people. And yet behind all of that was a mom and dad battling to raise their kids with their struggles, with their pain. There's something in Jairus' story of reminding us that people are more than their stuff. People are more than their status. And Jesus seems to get that. Imagine the scene 
hundreds of people, probably thousands of people. They're all gathered together. Jesus has stopped the crowd. Well, actually, this is just before that. Jairus, we're told at the start of the story, comes running up to Jesus and throws himself on his knees and grabs hold of Jesus' feet. Now imagine the crowd witnessing this moment. This is their local celebrity. This is their man who has everything on his knees, holding on to the feet of the man who supposedly has nothing. See, Jairus' story, the beauty of Jairus' story for us is that it gives us permission for authenticity, permission to admit that we need help, permission to be free from being solo pilgrims and invite others into the journey. This is the moment where we have permission to stop being solo hikers and start walking with others. To the woman with no name, Jesus says, I see you, I know you, come home. To the worship leader with everything, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. It's a beautiful reminder, the fact that Jesus sees us, he knows us, he wants to meet us in the seclusion of our own hearts and to make his love known to us there. Some great research was done by some friends of mine, two scholars, one's with Jesus now, Randy Reese and Rob Bloom. And what these scholars did was they, they looked at the gospels and they took every instance of Jesus interacting with a human being and they documented it and they researched it and they actually recognized that there was a pattern with which Jesus did life alongside others. And they were able to put it into four categories. And actually later next year, I'm gonna talk about those four categories because they help us really think about life on mission and, and being followers of Jesus. But one of the categories that they recognize is that every time Jesus interacts with someone in the gospels, they call it particularizing. And what that meant is this, is that Jesus was able to meet each person where they were individually on their journey and speak and minister to them particularly them. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that so hopeful for all of us to be reminded this morning that that is how Jesus desires to meet you and me? So how do we become known in community? That's my reflection this week that I wanna send us home with. How do we become a Riverview Church known in community? Well, here, here's a few thoughts that I have. Becoming known in community is only possible within, first of all, a culture of risk and faith and audacity. I think that's what we're supposed to learn from this unnamed woman. The question is this, do I want this and am I willing to go after it? Like, do I want to be known and am I willing to become known? That's the vision, but do we really want it? I know I've told you about this before, but at my church in Canada, on Sunday evenings, we had a recovery ministry, men and women, gathered together to support one another from their addictions. Once a month, I would go along as the pastor to serve communion and to pray for uh, men and women and offer pastoral support. And this community was just mind-blowing to me because it shouldn't have worked. This is the most dysfunctional people in our whole community. And yet that flourish, uh, that community flourished and it grew and it grew and it grew. It, was, it became its own energetic ball of community and life and church. It was a really powerful thing to be a part of. But one of the, every time I would go, I would have the same thought, and it was this, to be in this community is risky. To be in this community is risky, and here's why. Entrance to that community had a secret password, like getting into the mines of Moria, right? Speak, friend, and enter, Tolkien said. To get into this community, you had to actually stand up. So I would have had to stand up at the start of the meeting and say, my name's Stephen McCready, not Pastor Steve, my name's Stephen McCready, and I am celebrating recovery in the areas of, and I had to list the areas of addiction that I was being set free from with Jesus. And every single time I came to that moment, I was like, this is so risky. This is so risky to put myself out there. And yet that's what we see in this woman, this audacious risk of saying, I need Jesus. I need to belong. I need community. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to grab a hold. Secondly, to become known in community, I think it's only going to be possible if we can create a culture of vulnerability 
and authenticity. The question I'm reflecting on is, am I willing to open my life to share my story? Vulnerability is a kind of gross word. It's a, it's a modern word. People talk about it a lot. It actually comes from the Latin word vulnus, which means an open wound, an open and seeping wound. Gross, Steve, way too early on a Sunday morning. When you go rock climbing, your hands get absolutely trashed. This is what my hands look like after a rock climbing session. There should be a photo that comes up on the screen here, hopefully, because it, it, I'm kind of hoping it comes up. So they're healed up pretty well at the moment, but at any point, this is why a fist bump with me is always better than a handshake. Now, when you climb, your hands, they, they just get torn to pieces and they're a mess. But the, the a strange thing happens when you're a climber is that your hands, despite looking like that, actually in this weird transaction, become like a badge of honor. Like that's, that's how, you know, whoa, you're, you're a serious climber because look at your hands. Whenever I go climbing with my 14-year-old daughter, she's off climbing with her climbing club. And then at the end, she runs and she gets into the car. Before she tells me what level she's been climbing at or some amazing thing she's done on a boulder wall, she'll, her first thing will always be, Dad, look, my fingers are bleeding. <laughs> because it's like a badge of honor. The idea of vulnerability is living in such a way that people see that we are all wounded. And in the strangest transaction, it helps others. In this, it, it's a kingdom thing, but then the kingdom of God's upside down. It's a kingdom thing that our woundedness actually brings healing to others. You see, in the kingdom of God, we help people from our weakness, not our strength. Which begs the reason why do churches spend so much time displaying their strength? When in the kingdom of God, we actually minister to people out of weakness, it's out of our woundedness. That's what it means to be vulnerable. To become known in community, we need to be willing to allow others to see that we don't have it all together. I don't, anyone else? I don't have it all together. Oh, I wish I did, but I don't. I'm not hopeful that I ever will. And that's why the last thing I wanna say is this. Becoming known in community is only gonna be possible within a culture of gospel-fueled grace. Now, not cheap grace. I'm not talking about cheap grace where everyone gets a free pass for everything. I'm talking about gospel-fueled grace. You see, at the center of the story that we read today from Luke chapter eight, it's a story of a bleeding woman and a worried worship leader. And at the center of both of them is Jesus both of their stories pivoting around him. It's around Jesus that both of these men's, uh, men and women's stories become fueled by his grace. See, his grace towards a woman who is legally, legally, I should say, legally outside the community of faith. His grace towards a leader who is important and influential. This is not cheap grace, guys. You see, in his death, Jesus goes and actually pays the legal cost, the legal ramifications of this woman who's breaking the law of Leviticus chapter 15. In his death, Jesus is entering into death so that by his stripes we are healed. So that this young girl who is asleep or dead, but, but dead, we know she's dead, the others think she's just asleep, is that they can be raised to life. See, Jesus is gonna enter into death, and by his stripes, like I said, we are healed. To become known in community, to become a relational community who pay attention to one another with the affection of Christ, then the cross of Christ must stand at the very center of our shared lives together. Life together in Christ is only possible through Christ. Okay, I think, that, I think that's something that we have to anchor ourselves to. Life together in Christ is only possible because of Christ. So how do we move forward from here? What does it look like as we step into our vision? Well, I just wanted to offer three things that all of us can be praying for as we move towards our vision together at Riverview Church. Three things that I think God needs to do in me and in you and in us together. So this is what I'm asking us to, as we move forward from today to, to, to do. We need to pray for new eyes to begin to see the image of God in one another. 
unless the Lord actually gives us new eyes, that's not gonna happen. And we're just gonna beat about the bush. But if he did, imagine if he did, he actually give us a new vision for how we hold one another and see one another. So new eyes, new ears to become a listening people who pay attention to one another's stories, listening well for the activity of God in one another and new hearts, new hearts to receive the love of Christ and to live that love and by living grace toward one another. So that's how I wanna pray today. But I'm gonna invite Tanya to come up and she's actually gonna pray for us and then she's got some announcements. But new eyes to see, new ears to hear and new hearts to receive the love of Christ in us, for us and in one another. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Dave. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your living word. As we open our Bibles this week, I pray that you would help us to, that you would give us actually the desire to open your word and to be expectant. That Jesus, as we read your word this week, that it will come alive in our hearts and minds. And that we would know that we're being transformed, that we're being renewed by your spirit day by day. And Jesus, together today, we're asking you that you would give us new eyes to see one another with your affection. We pray that you transform our hearts so that we would, without any effort of our own, just our willingness, your spirit would so fill our hearts that we would see each other with your affection. And that Holy Spirit, you would also give us your wisdom so that as we talk together, as we walk together, as we do things together, as we meet together, that we would have your ability, Jesus, to be very particular with one another, to be patient in listening to stories, eager to help, eager to give grace to one another and to be a community who is deeply at peace with you and with each other. And so Jesus, we thank you for this life that you're forming us into, this people that you're forming us to be as Riverview Church. And may we reflect you well this week. In Jesus' name, amen.